Hello and welcome to Alabama. No wait, we mean this video on inbreeding. We get those two confused so often. For now, if we ignore the moral and cultural objections inbreeding makes sense, there is a large number of people of similar attributes, background, culture, and more who are in proximity. They would be the obvious way to increase a population very quickly without intersocietal conflict. As we know from the mother, sister, brother, father knot, that is the family tree of anyone from the south, this has happened before. As we also know, this has led to problems and is exactly why, if we ignore the moral and ethical objections of inbreeding, there are more prescient and important reasons that inbreeding is bad. Alright, we'll stop picking on America for now and look at exactly what is happening and why. Inbreeding is something we've touched on before when we spoke about genetic drift and genetic diversity. Those videos highlighted some examples of a phenomenon known as population bottlenecking. This is where a small number of people give rise to a population as the original progenitors. The inverse of starting from a small population is inbreeding, where a diverse population remains inside the same shallow pool of genetics, and so diversity of that pool shrinks. That is the opposite of what happens slowly with the bottleneck population. That is where the genetic pool starts out very small and expands while competing with the time taken. The longer an inbred family goes on, or more accurately the number of generations that occur, the worse things will get. At least in theory, a bottleneck population should over time become somewhat more genetically diverse, thereby becoming less prone to problems. There's been a number of studies that look at the variety of inbreeding scenarios across different species and populations, and even in different environments. This research has found that there's more than just the immediately obvious or visible signs relating to inbreeding. Birds and mammals would indicate that it has a significant effect on birth weight, survival, reproduction, and even resistance to some diseases. It can have effect on predation, environmental stress, and more factors that just aren't apparent on the surface. Couples who have trouble reproducing may simply have poor genetics, physical anomalies, or more, or there might be something going back several generations that has adversely affected them now. Plants are not immune to this, although they are more likely to be resistant. It often comes down to the genetic diversity of the plants themselves but it can affect seed set, germination, survival, and resistance to various diseases. This eventually leads to a higher rate of extinction. That means that the worse inbreeding becomes, the more likely a species is to die out. While some people may insist diversity is the spice of life, they are often wrong. In this instance, they do have an argument. The different genes in individuals who are not closely related allows mutations to occur which impart advantages, and remove those that are adverse. We see this with congenital defects. These lead to a higher rate of neonatal death and then infant death if the child is born. This can also create other undesirable attributes. A word you may hear come up several times from here out is co-sanguineous. This means father-daughter, mother-son, brother-sister, and similar. The immediate pairing of two individuals who are directly related is known as a consanguineous relationship. These are going to create a number of problems. The first and most immediate is that if you have a consanguineous pairing, there's a 25% chance that any child born of them would have two copies of the same allele from both parents. This means two copies of the same gene. And as we've mentioned already, the idea of having sexual reproduction is to remove some of these adverse genes, but if rather than having one version of that and one version that is good, you instead wind up with two bad copies, you've just found yourself in a very bad position, or any offspring are so. We previously described that there's recessive and dominant alleles in our video on Mendelian genetics and others, the simple version of which is that any gene is either dominant or recessive. The dominant allele will override the effect of any companion recessive allele when there is only one copy of each. If there is two dominant alleles, the dominant allele is in effect. If there are two recessive alleles, then the two recessive alleles are in effect. 
This leads to two more terms you should know, homozygous meaning two of the same, or heterozygous, one of each. Homozygous is either going to be very good or very bad for the offspring of a consanguineous relationship. Either they're going to have two good copies of an allele, or two bad copies. If they're heterozygous, it's going to mean that they are a silent carrier of the bad or recessive allele. This means that if they themselves then reproduce with someone closely related, the chances of their offspring yet again have the similar probability of passing on two copies or a homozygous copy of the recessive allele. As this repeats over multiple generations, the frequency of these genes increases, and so does the probability of passing it on to the next generation. This is strongly demonstrated in the royal families of many dynasties and Europe. When we're looking at just simply inbreeding within a family, you'll note that the concentration of certain defects increases drastically. This has led to inbreeding being demonstrated in just about every species on the planet, but especially those we've tried to conserve from very small populations. This is because of that homozygosity that we mentioned. If you have a homozygous individual with recessive alleles, they are likely to exhibit all of the negative traits associated with that. These are deleterious. And in humans, this could be a variety of things, whether that's a variety of diseases that are passed on and inherited via genetics, or it could be physical traits. These traits are particularly well studied in those who are offspring of first cousin marriages, and even closer. In some studies, you can look at the relationship between individuals and describe that as a kind of inbreeding ratio. Then, look at the number of diseases that occur as a result of this, and several studies have done just that. One looked at 10 in particular. These found that there were particular populations, in this case, 25 isolated villages in the middle Dalmatian islands of Croatia. These island populations had a significant level of inbreeding. Not only did they have a relatively isolated population which led to the degree of inbreeding observed, but they also found that because of this, there was a uniformity in the environment. That meant that the genetic variations observed should not have been attributed to the environment, but rather to the degree of inbreeding observed. They then looked at 10 particular diseases. They found that inbreeding was closely related as a predictor for things like coronary heart disease, stroke, cancer, bipolar depression, asthma, gout, and ulcers, but strangely, not for type 2 diabetes. Looking at this on a much smaller scale, but one that's much clearer, we can see this in the Habsburg family tree. This is a notorious European line of royalty. Looking at the Spanish arm in particular, and the final member, Charles II, they had a genome that was practically on par with being brother and sister offspring. That is a seriously disturbed family. But not only were they disturbed, they had a chin you could put someone's eye out with by looking across a large room. Charles II in particular was incredibly sick and effectively sterile. His jaw deformity became more prominent throughout the generations as you can see in this family tree. The further along you get, as the number of generations with close proximity to each other, both genetically and family tree-wise, increases the protuberance of that jaw. We see this phenomena in many of the ancient empires where dynasties would inbreed for a number of reasons. It could be purity, image, anything really. Who knows what they were thinking at the time, other than what historians have written. It is one of the big reasons why ancient empires fell in one manner or another. To see a both similar degree of inbreeding and how difficult it is to achieve, we need to look at research animals. To get an established research animal strain, it takes 20 generations. That should tell you something about how closely related the Habsburgs and other nobles were over history. This is the reason why inbreeding is bad. Although practically effective, it is also practically a death sentence for anyone downstream in the family tree from you. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.